Okay, so this month we're looking at using GitHub Actions for continuous integration. Uh, if you're not familiar with continuous integration, this is the idea that every time you do some kind of operation on your repository, like a commit or merge a, or a pull request or open an issue or something like that, that an automated process is initiated to build the code and run any automated tests and then um, the idea especially for C++ code is you're developing on Windows you do something that happens to generate a warning or an error on another platform like Linux or Mac OS and you don't realize it because it didn't manifest on your local development environment so you push to the repository the automated builds run on the other platforms and then you get notification that the uh, build is broken or that a test broke or something like that so let's take a look at what this looks like so in the github documentation let's make this a little bigger uh, they have extensive documentation on github actions and uh, we're gonna look at a set a, a, a set of github actions that I've built up incrementally for a an open source repository uh, we'll see how that progresses as the implementation gets fancier and fancier and then we'll compare what I made by hand to using a, a set of github actions from a template so there's github projects github repositories out there that are marked as a template for a new project and there's one out there we'll look at it it has uh, it's a template set up for best practices to use CMake to do the building and the testing and VC package to handle any third-party dependencies that you might have and using github actions to do the building and the testing and using uh, the caching framework within github actions to cache the uh, third-party dependencies so if you've ever had to do something like build QT which takes a really long time you might say to yourself well I don't wanna have to build QT from scratch every time I make a change to my repository so uh, having a binary cache mechanism is certainly desirable so what are github actions well the idea is that there's some kind of an event that happens and the event initiates any workflow that subscribes to that event and then a workflow is one or more jobs and each job is one or more steps and the steps are basically commands is the way you can think of it and in github there's a way to uh, share both workflows and steps and the steps uh, are called actions so they kind of refer to the whole thing as github actions the whole framework and then within any particular job in the individual steps that are executed to uh, perform the the whatever process that the job represents like a build and test process individual steps are also called actions so it can be a little bit confusing but just know that they kind of refer to the whole process as github actions <clears throat> and then individual steps can consume um, github actions there's uh, actions that are provided by github you can consume actions from other people as long as they're public and you can consume actions from your own repositories you can write your own actions that can be reused and so on so that's basically the overall mechanism and if we take a look here the, by the way their documentation is excellent I, I read through almost every single page including like a lot of the advanced stuff and uh, their documentation is really good so if you're you know wanting to know more details about any of the things we're going to talk about tonight you know feel confident that you can find the answer in the github documentation so here's the you can see in this diagram it's what I described that there's some an event 
and then it initiates a workflow and the workflow runs jobs and the jobs execute on a runner the runners are provided there are runners for ubuntu you know uh, linux flavors ubuntu is the most common uh, one that you would use and then there are runners provided by github that run uh, on windows and there are runners that provided by github that can run Ma on mac os x so <clears throat> if you've used any continuous integration framework previously like travis um, travis was what pretty much everybody used in the open source world before github actions were a thing um, but the problem with travis is that they had very limited capacity to run mac os builds so it was uh, difficult on a free account anyway to get uh, Mac OS uh, validation of your build and test cycle. Now, <clears throat> you might have in your test phase, you might have to interact with things like databases, or you might have to uh, run in a particular hardware environment. Like, for instance, you might need uh, a GPU available to run graphics oriented tests. In some of those scenarios it can be covered by the the github runners there's a way to basically uh, set up a database using uh, docker containers and things like that um, so for standard like database things like you know just get a postgres instance or a mysql instance there's a way to do that within the github runner provided framework so the that you're you're executing on the runners provided by the github infrastructure if you need a specialized environment, like for instance, you need to interact with uh, during your test phase, or maybe even during your build phase, you need to interact with resources that are internal to your company or uh, resources that are uh, requiring specific hardware that isn't available in these virtual machines that GitHub uses for their runners. You can set up your own self hosted runner. They don't recommend that you do that for open source repositories however they recommend that your repository be private in order to use a self-hosted runner it's not like it blocks you but it's a matter of uh, best practices and um, you know security considerations so um, this is an overview of what happens and so the workflow represents a collection of jobs and the workflow is what is triggered by an event so they show here two runners and two jobs uh, they don't have a visual representation of the workflow but the workflow encompasses the two jobs that are initiated by this event and you can orchestrate uh, jobs so that they can have dependencies between jobs so you by default it all the jobs within a workflow are initiated in parallel um, but you may have say a build job and then a bunch of test jobs that you want to run the test jobs in parallel but they all have to run after the build job completes so you can make the test jobs depend on the build jobs uh, and you can you can have more complex dependency graphs if, if you need that um, now uh, you might be thinking to yourself right away uh, wait a minute they're providing these machines to run my code for free isn't there some kind of limit and the answer is yes there are limits but for a we'll just take a look really quick down here if you're you know using the free account on github you can have 20 concurrent jobs running five concurrent mac os jobs running that's because the mac os hardware is more specific and they have you know less numbers of that than they can run on these these virtual machines on these big servers and the um, it turns out that basically the limits are so high like a thousand API requests per hour um, each workflow is limited to you know 35 days of execution time each job within a workflow is limited to six hours of execution time so Personally, if I had a continuous integration job that took six hours to execute, there's something wrong, okay? These things are supposed to run quickly and give you the answer quickly. 
um, I, I realized that, you know, the more tests you add, the longer it takes to run. And the more complicated uh, test environments it takes to set things up, then, the, then the, you know, the longer it can run. But really, the, these limits are so high that I can't see that you would ever bump into them. Uh, and, and that's pretty good for a free account. Um, obviously, these limits go up if you pay for um, the, the paid accounts that you use with uh, GitHub. Um, but for a free account, open source projects, public repositories, the limits are so high that, you know, I, I wouldn't expect any of my, certainly none of my projects to ever run into the limits. Um, so that's pretty nice. The, they're, the limits also are higher than what, I, I don't re recall exactly what the Travis limits were, but I seem to recall them being lower, particularly, um, I think that like for free repo open source repositories, like you couldn't even get access to any Mac OS builds. So how is this all controlled? Well, uh, basically all of this is managed through a YAML file. YAML, it, it just stands for yet another markup language. It's, it's a simple text-based format where structure is indicated by white space indentation. And then, you know, lists are shown with this, you know, dashes and then name value pairs have the name and then a colon and then the values in ne underneath. And, you know, so here we've got an array of steps this particular step has additional settings inside it and it, these are name value pairs within this object and then that is a name value pair within this object and then that object is at the top level and we'll take a look at um, some specific examples for a repository that I have I have a if you ever used Usenet there's a news reader called TRN. I have a fork of that. I forked it off of SourceForge. SourceForge is kind of dying, if not completely dead at this point. I forked it off SourceForge into GitHub, and I've been modernizing it with a CMake build and switching the network communication to Boost ASIO, which is why we talked about NNTP protocol and Boost ASIO over the past few months when we talked about asynchronous networking. And I wanted to add this continuous integration to that project because I added automated tests, but I wanted to make sure that the Linux build stayed working while I was, because my primary development environment is on Windows and it was too easy to break things in the Linux build. And I wanted to make sure that the tests stayed green on Linux as well without me having to, uh, you know, either build up a WSL environment or, you know, find a, you know, virtual machine and build up a, a an Ubuntu image inside that virtual machine so letting github manage that for me and let me know when I break something that's going to be much better than uh, having me doing it by myself I mean I can do it manually but automation is always better than doing it manually so here is the name of this workflow this is just basically a display name and uh, Sorry, this is the name of the workflow, and then this is the display name, this run name. And then this on keyword says what events we're going to trigger this workflow on. So in this case, we're going to trigger it on any kind of push of commits to any branch in this repo. All these uh, events and things have uh, filters that you can narrow it. So like it's only pushes to the development branch. So if people have their own you know, feature branches that they're working on. You won't necessarily run workflows on those feature branches. You can customize all of this. And it's all described very well in the GitHub Actions documentation. And inside here, we've got an array of jobs. So we've got one job that's uh, name is called CheckBats version. It's going to run on Ubuntu latest. So that says what kind of runner will be used to execute the steps that correspond to this job. And then for the steps, we've got a checkout step. There's a setup Node.js step where it says, I want Node.js version 14. And then there's a step here where we're running a, a, just an arbitrary command, and that's doing an npm install. npm install is uh, 
how you uh, specify third-party packages in uh, Node.js. So you obtain your third-party dependencies. In this case, they're installing globally a dependency called bats, and then they're going to run that uh, command that was provided by that dependency and you know run it with dash v to get you know just a version spitting out now um, yeah we're gonna get in we're gonna get into that okay. so these run steps are running a command and then this uses actions. This is where I was saying there's a canned action that you can consume from a repository on GitHub and uh, run those, you know, canned steps so that you don't have to repeat those details over and over in different workflows. The checkout action is the thing that takes your Git repo and clones it into the workspace of the runner. And then uh, so when you say uses action slash, this is coming from the uh, this is the GitHub user ID, and then this is the repo, the name of the repo, and then this at v3. The v3 is just a GitHub or a sorry a Git tag that identifies what version of the action that you want. And for strict security considerations, they recommend that you not use a symbolic version name but or a symbolic tag name but that you use a particular hash and that way you're locked into a, a specific version and nobody can you know switch out the code from underneath you and do something you know suspect uh, so that's best practices for uh, you know strictest security but it means that if version 3 gets a bug fix you're on a particular hash and you won't get that bug fix until you go and update your hash to the hash that includes the bug fix. If you use a symbolic name like a v3 tag then they can move the tag to new hashes you know they change the hash that's associated with that symbolic tag you get the uh, you know the bug fix is kind of for free but you can see how you know if you're depending on third party um, depending on third-party actions you may for um, strictest you know control of vulnerabilities use a hash rather than a symbolic name the username actions this is these actions come from github so they can be trusted with a symbolic tag when we look at uh, the canned template later we'll see that we'll be consuming some actions from somebody else's repository and in that case you might want to use a hash instead of a symbolic name uh, did that answer your question okay good uh, and, and in this case I mean this is a little example is doing some node JSE stuff so it's it's gonna you know do a setup node and then here the you can see that some of these uh, canned actions they can take additional parameters to specify something other than the default. In this case, they're going to specify the particular version of Node.js that they want. They want version 15. Uh, there are canned actions relating to CMake and relating to uh, running tests and stuff like that. We'll, we'll see what that looks like when we look at the uh, template that's out there. And it's not the only template. It, it, I When I looked around for templates I kind of looked at the one that was like the most used and so that's the one that I uh, I grabbed to look at but let's take a look at what this looks like when we're doing it ourselves so here's my initial stab at a CMake build workflow so you know I've got the name it's just build and then my run name I'm using this little uh, it's called an expression to get a value from the workflow environment um, and we'll see how that looks uh, as as we go on uh, no it's special to github actions 
Uh, we're gonna and we're gonna get into that. I'm gonna explain all this stuff uh, in more detail, but I wanted to get to just look at a particular example here so we can see what it looks like for C++ code. So um, I'm gonna initially run on Ubuntu latest. I when we get to the end, I've got it running on Ubuntu and I've got it running on Windows. But generally speaking, my experience is that. Uh, Although I'm developing on Windows, so I know that every I know that all the build and tests run. It's just that uh, it's always a little bit harder to get things to run on Windows first. So if we, you know, if you want to get up and running, um, usually it's easier to get the Linux one going first and then extend it to Windows, which is the approach that I took. So I'm using this checkout action, the standard checkout action, and you can see here I've provided an additional input to that action to say to check out with submodules because following uh, VC package best practices so I'm using VC package to manage my third-party dependencies we'll just show you what that what the dependencies are I've got let's go up here up up VC package dot JSON so I'm depending on boost ASIO which in turn depends on like another 50 or so libraries in Boost. Uh, on Windows, I'm using PD Curses to give me Curses functionality, and I'm depending on GTest for uh, my unit tests. So, <clears throat> following best practices for VC package, to there's kind of two ways you can view. Um, your dependencies with VC package. One is you can always build against head. Now, building against head means, in a VC package sense, it means you're always getting the latest version of VC package, and in turn, that means you're always getting the latest definition of all the package recipes for the dependencies from VC package, which in turn means you may get a newer version of a dependency than what you initially specified. Or, or what you were initially using when you added the dependency initially. And that's, you know, building against head, right? I'm, I'm not only building against the head of my code in my repository, but I'm also building against the head of all the third-party dependencies that I'm consuming. And, for instance, this is kind of what uh, Google does in their environment. They always build against head of everything, and, they, and if they need to rebuild something, then they do. You know, if a third-party dependency changes, they always consume the latest version of that third-party dependency, and you know it ripples through their whole system. And if it breaks, then they they change their code to adapt to head. So that's one strategy. Another strategy is to strictly manage the version of the third-party dependencies that you're consuming, and only move to a newer version when you decide to to do that. So it's it's uh, manually managing the versions of your dependencies. And the way you do that in VC package is instead of getting VC package randomly from your environment, you add VC package as a submodule in your repo, and you check out the submodule at a particular hash. And by doing that, you are locked in to particular versions of the recipes for the uh, dependencies that you're consuming. So that's why I've that, and that's the approach that I've chosen here. So I've got. VC package as a submodule. If we go up here and look at my git modules file, you can see here's my VC package submodule that I'm using. So I, that's why I'm checking out with submodules, and that's how I'm managing the versions of my dependencies via VC package. So um, I'm going to do the standard thing. I'm going to make my build directory outside my source tree. So I'm doing an out of a so called out of tree build. Um, this special dollar brace brace syntax allows you to access parameters to the workspace uh, and generic parameters all with inside everything that triggered the execution of a job within a workflow corresponding to an event and what github actions calls this they call this expression syntax uh, and it's basically, you know, name value pairs, and they're in, uh, arranged in a hierarchy, and the top level of the hierarchy, in this case GitHub, 
is referred to as a context and so I'm accessing the workspace value of the github context now what that is and these are all documented again out on the github documentation pages for github actions the workspace value represents the path in the local file system of the runner where my code is checked out so that's essentially my source dir in, in CMake terms. So by going up one and then making a directory called build, I'm making a build directory outside of my source directory, which is out of tree build is recommended to be the best practice for CMake so that you know if something in your build is like scribbling random files around, it's guaranteed to not, you know, write files into your source code repository that you have to then git ignore and so on like that. So um, when you use CMake in conjunction with VC package, the way VC package glues into CMake is it presents itself as a toolchain file that you pass to CMake via the CMake toolchain file direct, uh, variable. The um, file from VC package, because I've got VC package as a submodule inside my workspace, so. I'm using my GitHub workspace and then the path down into the submodule of the toolchain file. Uh, the dash s argument to CMake is specifying the source directory, which is just my workspace value, and then the dash b is my build directory, which I've specified as outside, you know, the build directory that's appear to my source directory, not in my source directory. So when I this was like my initial attempt so all we're doing is the configure stage we're not actually building the code yet so this is doing the configure stage but it's also getting VC package into the picture and making sure that all the VC package machinery works and once you take a file like this which is this YAML file it just lives in the uh, .github workflows directory from the top of your repository so here's the top of my source directory my repository so this .github and then workflows and it's I called mine build but the name of the file uh, can be whatever you want it doesn't have to be called build and once I've done that then when I push that file We'll go all the way back here in my history. Uh, when I push that file, it creates the workflow and runs the job. And you can see here it did the, uh, this is my very first version where I was just imitating what they had in their little example. So it did the checkout action, it did the setup node action, it did the npm install and it ran these commands. And you can expand any one of these to see what it actually did. Uh, so let's go back up here and find, oh, we're back on page two, or page one. Let's take a look at, let's try this one. Okay, so here I've done, you know, just to check out, it, I, I didn't uh, show you every single version of this file. I kind of just tap tagged the interesting versions of the file. So here I just did a CMake version to see what uh, version of CMake is in my Ubuntu environment. Had CMake not been in the environment, I would have had to run some kind of action to obtain CMake. There's standard actions for getting the latest version of CMake. It's either standard or it's a user contributed action. Uh, 3.26.4 is good enough for me. And then the checkout, it does the git operations to check out the code and then check out the submodules. So here you see entering VC package that's checking out the submodule. And then at the end, so this just did the checkout number two, my build number two. Let's see my build number three. Let's see if that did. Okay, so here's the first one uh, where I pushed it and it did the CMake step. So it applied the the toolchain file and here you can see the value of that workspace github.workspace context value when it would expand it out 
at the time that the workflow ran. So it turned into slash home slash runner slash work slash TRN dash actions. That's the name of my repository. And then, you know, when you when you clone a repository, it creates a directory that is the name of the repository. So that's why TRN actions appears again. And then here's the subdir VC package where I've got the sub module checked out. Uh, scripts build system VC package CMake. That's the toolchain file. And then here's my source directory, home runner work, TRN actions, TRN actions. And then my build directory is home runner work, TRN actions, TRN actions, dot, dot, build. And you can see it ran the VC package stuff and it's going to go and grab 61 dependencies that are needed. And you can see here, uh, or uh, sorry, this is Linux. On Linux, it doesn't need PD curses. That's only Windows. So there's only 60 packages it needs to fetch on Linux. So it goes and fetches them all and builds, you know, all of those packages. And then after, um, let's see, where is the last bit? Okay, so here's gtest, performing post build validation. So all the way down to here, 848 lines worth, is all just the VC package obtaining my dependencies and getting them ready for me to compile my code against it. Now we're in the regular configure stage of CMake where it's configuring my code to be uh, compiled for the first time. And in my code, this, uh, this is, like I said, it's an open source NNTP newsreader and it's pretty ancient code so it uses a lot of honestly at this point antiquated kind of Linux Unix I won't even say Linux it's it predates Linux by like probably 10 years at least because this this uh, code first originated in the 80s so um, it, it's scraping around looking for various uh, header files uh, some of some of those techniques that are used from these header files are probably antiquated. It should probably be modernized, but that's the way the code is for now. And then um, it finally finishes configuring, and then it generates the build project. And I don't. I only have in my script. I only have at this point. I only have the script to run the configure step. Now, as you can see, though, there was a lot of machinery involved just getting the configure step working. There's all this VC package stuff. So my recommendation if you're adding continuous integration to your project for the first time is to proceed in small steps like this. Get, a, get one piece of it working and debugged before you add on the next stage of whatever your build pipeline, build and test pipeline is going to be. So uh, let's go back over here. Visual Studio. So this is what kind of like my version one was, was just to get the VC package dependency stuff working and get a CMake configure working correctly on Ubuntu. Is there a question? So VC package can do binary caching, but it always starts by obtaining the source. Now, um, in my example so far, I'm not using any binary caching, so it's gonna every time it runs the workflow, it's gonna download all the source code and it's going for the dependencies and it's going to build whatever needs to be built. Obviously, if it's a header-only library, there's nothing that needs to be built. But a bunch of these libraries need to be compiled so they get compiled. And the source code is downloaded every time that I execute this workflow because I'm not, I haven't put any caching into this workflow yet. Now, uh, when we get to the, uh, just consuming the template from the, you know, recommended best practice we'll see that it's using caching of the built products and so uh, and we'll see in the workflow execution times that it dramatically increases uh, after the first build where it's got the locally cached built products and that's using a binary cache mechanism that's built into VC package um, but you can see why you want that binary cache mechanism if you do if you're consuming 
as a dependency, something like OpenSSH or, uh, or OpenSSL or uh, Qt, because Qt itself can take hours to build, depending on how many components of Qt you're consuming. Uh, Qt is a very large surface area library. Uh, and it, and it, uh, it does all the GUI stuff from scratch at raw pixel level. So um, it's quite a bit of code. But um, the philosophy of VC package is you depend on it on some third party library. If VC package doesn't have a binary cached version of the right, you know, it has to have like a debug version and a release version, and it has to be a debug version for Windows. We're using the right, um, whether using static runtime or dynamic runtime and using multi threaded runtime or single threaded runtime. There's all these combinations. And the philosophy that VC Package started with was we will download the source code and we will build it locally unless we already have it locally. And so the second time you build, it's not fetching all that stuff from the internet and building it again. But since we're doing continuous integration, every time one of these runners starts up, it doesn't have any pre-existing build to go from. So the first build in one of these workflows is always going to build your dependencies via VC package. Now, over time, they added a caching mechanism to VC package, and first they started by caching, you know, the source code. So if it already had the source code downloaded, but it didn't have the source code locally built, it wouldn't fetch the source code from the internet again. It would just build it. Then they added binary caching mechanism to VC package so that uh, you can obtain the built dependencies, if it's the proper com, you know, configuration for what you're trying to consume in your build, you can obtain those dependencies, uh, pre-built ones from a, a cache, and they have a variety of cache mechanisms available, of which GitHub Actions is one. So they have like a NuGet cache, and there's even a way that you, if you don't want to use any of those caching mechanisms, you can throw your built stuff out onto uh, Amazon S3 storage, I believe, and there's a way to just you know grab a blob off of S3. So, um, so far what we're doing though, there's no caching. Uh, so let's go look at the next iteration of things. Okay, so in my version two here, all I've added is um, a build step. And if we go back over here, let's see if we can find a build step. It's probably this one. Okay, so here, uh, this is like a, a slightly different iteration because I had like a little, I threw in a little thing just to see if Clang Tidy was available. So uh, I haven't mentioned this yet, but that's another thing you can do with these workflows is run automated static analysis on your code via Clang Tidy or CPP check or Sonar Cube. These are all things we've talked about in previous years. Um, so, but here you can see I'm. Uh, just doing a little, you know, dumping out of stuff from the environment because I wasn't, you know, it's kind of interesting to just to see, you know, what does it look like when these commands run? So we just do an ls and we see here it's it's basically all the files that from the top level of my repository. So by default, all these commands run inside the source dir of your checked out repository. Uh, we've got our configure step here and then I've got a build step here. And you can see um, this code is old and slightly crufty. It's using, you know, character literals in place where it should only, it's, it should, you know, the type of a character literal is a const care star, but it's passing it to a function that's taking a care star. So you get this writable strings, you know, warning coming out. So it's gotten better over time. I haven't fixed all these yet. I will eventually have to fix them all. So the build runs, it's quite a number of files and a bunch of warning spew. So we get down here, we finally get down to the end. It built all my code and it built my tests successfully. Um, so that was our next step. So as I say, I recommend that when you're developing this stuff, you go one small step at a time and keep everything working. If you try to do too much at once, then when you run into trouble, you don't know like, well, which one of these things is actually busted. So 
uh, keep building it up incrementally is what I recommend. And if we take a look at version 3 here. So in version 3, what did I add here? Oh, I think it was just I was, uh, well, I don't know, let's just go look at here. Let's look at version 2 again. How is it different? Oh, version 3, that was corresponds to the job output that we looked at. I just added some commands here just so I could inspect the environment on the runner because you don't have any direct access to the, these runners. Um, they're just virtual machines that are spun up and then a bunch of commands are fired at them. So if you kind of want to see what the environment looks like over there, you can always put these temporarily in, in your workflow to say, like, you know, just show me what, you know, what's the current working directory when these commands are running and, you know, what kind of files are li living inside there and what kind of version of CMake am I getting by default unless I want to control the version of CMake myself, I'm just going to use whatever in the environment. Uh, you know, and similarly, you know, hey, maybe, you know, do I even have Clang Tidy? Is it even in the environment? Turns out it is, and it's uh, a recent version. I think it was 15. Uh, might be back here. What version of Clang Tidy did we get? We got version 14. That's not too bad. It's not the latest, but it's not too bad. Um, Clang and Clang Tidy tools have been moving pretty quickly. I think they're currently on like version 18 or something. Uh, so if you wanted a newer version, you'd have to put an action, uh, in, uh, a step in to go and get Clang Tidy from somewhere and update it, you know, whether it's using Ubuntu's package mechanism, or whether you're just going to download a, a, a zip file and un, unzip it to get the binary, what have you. So, you know, it can be just um, instructive to understand what's going on in the runner environment by just throwing some commands in there to just put out, dump out some information. So, uh, if we take a look at the next version. Okay, so now I've got my configure step working. I've got my build step working. So, let's run an invocation of ctest. Now, I had unit test executables that I wrote with gtest before I started working on this workflow thingy, but I wasn't quite using ctest yet, so I made small modifications to my CMake lists. Uh, to enable ctest, you just basically include ctest and then uh, bracket any building of test subdirectories with if build testing and then uh, one other thing you do which is kind of nice is to if you use gtest discover tests then every unit test that you've written with gtest as a gtest test case turns into an individual c test test case so you kind of get one-to-one -one correspondence between all your gtest test cases and all your ctest test cases. And really under the covers, all it's doing is invoking your test executable with a gtest filter to say run the one, one test case. Uh, normally when I run these at my desk, I just run the executable, the, the gtest executable, and it runs all the tests. So um, I had done that so that I could use ctest from here and it would run all the uh, tests that I needed. I need to tell it where it should start looking for C test files, which is in the in my build directory, and I need to tell it what configuration to run, um, and then I can run the tests. Let's see if we can find. I believe this is the first one that had the tests because some of them failed. So if we take a look here, inside this build log. Uh, oh, and by the way, you can see this thing took 4 minutes, 15 seconds to run, so it's a lot faster for us to look at what happened in retrospect rather than try to run each one of these every time I'm changing the code. But you can see that on Linux, even though all I had all these test cases passing on Windows, on Linux, these, uh, these tests were failing. Now, by default, when you run ctest, 
it just tells you what tests failed. It doesn't show you the output from gtest, which has the individual assertions or the individual error message that is the root cause for why these tests failed. You can see I've got a whole bunch of tests here, like, you know, 400 some tests. Um, and this is just the output from ctest saying, hey, I started this test and oh, and it passed. You know, and then it starts the next test and then it passed. You know, these, these tests are running so quickly they don't even take uh, 10 milliseconds to run. They're all running in less than 10 milliseconds. It's what you want. You want your unit tests to be very, very fast. However, this is not so useful when we're down here and we find out these tests failed and we don't know the cause of the failure and because the test runner is a black box environment I can't just SSH into there and see what's going on so what we do to fix that is we go back here and we add to C test this uh, output on failure flag that means that when C test runs the test case and the test case fails it will put into the C test output the standard out of whatever command it was running that failed. So if we do that and we go back over here, I'm pretty sure it's just this next job. So if we look at this build output now, we look at the failed C test. Okay, now we're seeing the G test output and we're seeing the reason that these fa are failing is because it says there's a leaked mock object and that um, when you leak a mock object it doesn't validate the expectations set on the mock object these are mock objects created with gmock and so it's it considers it an error for you to uh, exit a test case without having validated the mocks that were used in the test case and so now what's kind of interesting is that it gave me this error on Linux, but it doesn't give me this error on Windows. So this is, a, again, an example of why you want to build on as many platforms as possible, even if they're not platforms that you ship on, because the testing frameworks and the compilers are different enough that they can point out problems that you may not be aware of if you only build and test on one platform. So building and testing your code on multiple platforms is beneficial even if you only ever ship on one platform. And uh, what I'm going to do to get around this problem is I'm just going to cheat for now and say uh, just don't run those tests that are failing. I'll fix it later. But right now I just want to get my workflow to be green and stay green while I develop, while, while I'm focused on getting my workflow running. So if we go back here, and now we'll be on page one of these logs. And if we look down here, here is a green build where you can see I've got that exclude NNTP connected test dot star. This is a regex that matches all the tests that were failing. So now everything is green. So that's good. That got us back to green. And what we want to look at next is let's uh, we can extend the set of events that trigger this workflow so previously I was just triggering on a push event which is fine um, that means if I push to any branch of this repository which is what I was doing I'm I was pushing all these workflow changes to a develop branch uh, you may want to restrict to say like you know only specific branches should trigger the workflow there's a way for you to filter that by specifying the branches that should run you can specify branches with inclusion patterns or exclusion patterns or by specific names however you want to do it uh, this workflow dispatch is an event that only is only initiated when you invoke the workflow manually and you can only invoke workflows manually that have been merged to the primary branch of the repository. So it's either master or main or whatever you're calling the primary branch of your repository. So there are certain things, there are not very many, but there are a few things like this, like workflow dispatch, 
that only happen on the def you know the default branch of the repository. So just keep an eye out for that. There's very few of them. That basically it's the stuff that's manually initiated. Um, and I've also said you know if somebody issues a pull request against my repository, run this workflow on their changes from their pull request, and that way I can see if their changes either broke the build on a particular platform because they didn't have that platform or maybe they didn't even test the build on their platform right they just submitted changes or they may have broken tests they may have forgotten to run the tests so on a pull request it's good to know that uh, because the workflow ran that their changes build and compile they build and uh, pass the tests on the platforms that we have enabled now I'm you know this is my little repo here so you know I'm not doing any pull requests I'm just doing pushes um, but there's a large number of events you can subscribe to here and the particular filters on the events allow you to you know specify very fine-grained situations to allow specific workflows to run and so far we've only talked about using a workflow for building and running the code but GitHub Actions as a framework supports events like somebody opened an issue on your repository. So you can um, have a workflow that when they open an issue, it automatically adds a label to the workflow or it does some, you know, it automatically adds a comment to the workflow or, or to the issue rather. So when people uh, open issues or edit issues or close issues or edit a wiki page or add a tag or edit a tag any any one of the things that constitutes some kind of interaction with your repository they they all trigger events and they can all be used um, to trigger workflows by subscribing to those events so it's not just um, automating building of code you can automate other parts of your release process and you can automate other parts of your issue tracking your bug tracker so it, it, I'm, I'm only showing you the stuff for building and testing code, but it, it, the, the framework of GitHub Actions encompasses you know, anything, that any interaction with the repository whatsoever. Okay, so what's next here? Um, okay, so now, what did I do? Expand triggers to manually dispatch and pull requests. So, uh, here, oh, I know what I've done here. Here, I've just pulled out some r repeated pieces of text that I had buried down in my build steps. I've just pulled them out into some environment variables. So here, I've this env keyword allows you to set environment variables that will be seen by all of the steps that are run as part of this job. So it's the job is called build. And I can specify environment for a particular job. If I put this env block at the very top level, then it's, then those environment variables are seen by all the jobs that are defined in this workflow. I can also add an env block to a particular step, and then those environment variables in that will be visible for that particular step only. And uh, if you have the same environment variable specified at inner and outer scopes, if you will, it's always the inner one that takes precedence like you would expect. Now, um, one thing to be aware of is that you can't have the value of one environment variable be uh, used as a value to define another environment variable. So all their values are set separately, if you will. Because uh, otherwise, there would have to be some kind of weird ordering, you know, like which order are you setting the environment variables? They just kind of get away from that by saying that um, you can't consume an environment variable value to set another environment variable. Um, it's really, in, in practice, it really doesn't amount to be a problem. So having pulled this stuff out up here, then down here, I can reference using the so remember this dollar brace brace syntax is the github action and expression syntax and I'm accessing the env context to get the build type uh, 
value from the env context and the env context represents the environment variables now here i've just used regular unix shell syntax to to write the environment variable but if you've ever tried to write portable scripts across windows and unix you realize that in unix it's dollar variable and then in windows it's percent variable so if i use this uh, GitHub expression syntax, it's a single syntax to access the value of an environment variable whether it's on Windows or on Linux. Now so far we're just on Linux so it's not an issue yet but uh, I will mention that in this name value for the step the name is the, the name that will be displayed in the GitHub action UI and if we go back over here and look at these logs if we look at say maybe this one no that's one where it's working let's go down here ah okay so here so this is the just the display name for this action for the sorry the display name for this step within a job so this is the build job. See, so it's in the jobs within the build workflow, and you see it says CMA configure dollar build config. Well, that's not really what I wanted to see. What I wanted to see was the value of the environment variable there, and that's because I was using dollar name here, and this isn't a Linux shell command. This is text that goes to the GitHub Actions UI. So for it to for the value to be expanded correctly, I needed to use this uh, GitHub GitHub Actions Expressions syntax to get access to the value. Uh, just point that out in case you were wondering, like, why did I do it the one way in the name field and another way in the run field where it has the the command, uh, and that was why. Okay, so uh, what's next? All right, so now I've got the, the finishing touches on this, and I've, uh, I've added a basic Windows workflow. Is that what I did? Let's just look at my git log here. Git log. Oh, I see what it's doing. Okay, so here in version 9, I've added the basic of... Um, a Windows build and I initially did that just by taking my Linux build copying it over and you'll notice on all my commands I've switched to using the github expression syntax to access the values of environment variables because I know that I eventually want to unify the the Linux build script and the Windows build script because they're mostly the same I don't want them uh, diverging too much so um, instead of using percent syntax on the command line for the, the, the Windows commands, I'm using the GitHub expressions. And if we go over to our logs here, uh, let's just try the, oh, I bet it's going to be this one that failed. Uh, so now I've got a build Linux. The build Linux is green, but the build Windows is failing. And if we look at what's failing in the build windows, it's failing in the configure step. And it's failing because this code has a little yak grammar for parsing ISO dates. Uh, and Bison was available in the Ubuntu runner environment so when I did the configure step looking for bison it found it and it was fine but bison wasn't cooked into the Windows runner so I needed to get a version of bison because my my CMake build script when it runs this uh, target when it builds the target for the the date parsing library it's going to run bison on the yak.y file to generate a source file and then that source file is going to be compiled to implement the, um, the the parser for these dates so I need to have bison 
So um, my next, that was my next challenge. And if we go here and look at the next thing, version 10, the way that I solved that. Now, Bison, there is a pre-built Windows binary out there. Unfortunately, it lives on SourceForge. And I don't know if you've ever tried to automate consuming zip files from SourceForge, but it's basically impossible because they've got everything set up so that the download links are not direct download links. They're things you click on in your browser, and it takes you to another page that shoves another ad in front of your face and then waits 10 seconds, and then it downloads the file. So you can't use that directly in an automated build because... All that's going to happen when you try to download the zip file is you're just going to get the source code for the HTML page that shoves the ad in your face and waits around for 10 seconds before it finally decides to download the file. Maybe there is a way to work around that, but I don't know what it is. So all I did was <laughs> go manually download the zip file myself, and I stuck it on my own URL so I could just um, grab that zip file. Now... You might say, like, well, wait a minute, you don't have wget and you don't have curl on Windows by default, so how did you, how did you do that? Well, I used the power of Google to find somebody else's recipe where they used PowerShell. And then in PowerShell, there's a command called invoke web request that will basically do like a wget action. And then I, I make a directory where I'm going to unpack the zip file. And then it turns out that 7-zip is available in the pre-built Windows runner. So I could use 7-zip to extract the zip file. And then it's kind of wacky, but um, there's an environment variable called github underscore path. And this is a environment variable that points to a file. And the file contains directories, one per line. And the file represents the executable path as used by the steps as they run. So if you want to add something to the path, you can append a line to that file. And then the next step will see that in the path when it runs. So it turns out there's a PowerShell command called add content. And the first argument is the name of the file that it, to add content to. And then the second argument is the content that will be added. Now, I have to add the bin directory for bison into the path. And you might say, well, wait a minute. It's just going to do find package for bison. So couldn't you just use the find package mechanism to specify the root folder for that package? And you're right, that will enable it to find bison. But when bison runs, it wants to invoke M4, the M4 macro processor, which is included in the zip file for bison. But there's no way for you to specify a variable to identify the location of M4. So I have to put this in the path so that it will first find bison during the configure step which is going to run down here. And then when I do the build step, and it invokes Bison, and Bison in turn tries to invoke M4, it will find it. And it, it took a bit of fussing around to, to, to figure out how to do this. Um, I just lucked out that somebody else had a, 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 a GitHub action uh, written as a thing that did a little PowerShell recipe, and so that gave me what I needed to do. Um, now, and I've kind of fancied up this workflow a little bit where I've given each of these steps a nice um, friendly name. Uh, is there a question? There is, there is an open issue request to get bison from VC package but it hasn't been implemented yet. It's a little bit, um, it's a little bit funky because, like I said, Bison depends on M4, so it's not just 
bison you'd have to go and get and build its its m4 as well and then adding it to your environment so that it's available in the path when you invoke um when you use the bison module from cmake to create you know the, the custom rules for running bison and adding it to your target it's not that I, i'm sure they'll get it eventually but but it's not available currently uh so this is the way i've been hacking around it is to go get that bison zip file off of uh SourceForge, and just so you know, if you try to go do this, it, it turns out it's not just one zip file, it's two zip files. There's one zip file that has the actual bison binary, and then there's another zip file that has all the dependent DLLs that it needs. So you actually have to get two zip files and unpack them into the same place. And so what I did was, I, I, I did that, got the two zip files, unpacked them into the same place, and then I made my own zip file that just had everything in it in one zip file. It, it, it's, it's just kind of a pain in the butt. Um, the way most people deal with this problem is they run bison on the grammar to get the generated C file and then they commit that generated fi source file to their tree. And then on, on Windows, they just don't even try to run bison. Um, I had actually made minor changes to the grammar and added a test for the date parser, so I wanted to run it from scratch. But uh, anyway, this is what you got to go through to get bison. It's a bit of a pain, but not, you know, it's solvable. A little Googling and uh, a little bit of repackaging of zip files and you know, then we're done. Okay, so if we go back over here and look at these logs, so here's where I was failing and fussing around trying to get things to work. You know, I get the one part to work and then I found out when it invokes M4 that it's going to barf again. So uh, I think when we get here, and I have a green build. So here's the download bison step. It did that, it unpacked it. You know, here's the little commands that it ran. And then when we did configure, if we go look all the way at the end, it will say found bison. And it's unpacked into a directory outside my source tree. That's how I did it. You, obviously, you could do it any way you want. And then when we run the, when we build the code, there's a uh, custom rule parse date. Uh, I think well, that's the one for the tests. I think it's there's a custom CMake rule. Here it is. This uh, building custom rule TRN actions parse date. This is the thing that's invoking bison, and here you can see the little bison output, and it's saying, you know, I had six shift reduced conflicts. If you're familiar with Yak, it's just kind of expected for there to be a couple of shift reduced conflicts. Okay, so we got that working, so good. Now we got a working Windows build, and we got a a working Linux build. And uh, okay, so this was uh, this. We'll take a look at what I had to do to get the bison dependency installed here or what was what were we doing here from v10 to v11 ah okay so now remember because i cloned my linux build to make my windows build and i knew that i had all my unit tests passing on windows so now i have adjusted my windows build to remove that exclusion of tests I mean, it's passing. I should still go fix that error by the leaked mock object. I, you know, we'll have to, it, it, it's some divergence between the Linux execution of GE mock and the, the Windows execution. Uh, so the next version. Now what I've done uh, is I've unified the two different build jobs by using what's called a matrix configuration matrix build strategy or job strategy I guess strictly speaking and that is up here so here we are we're in here's our build job and then for strategy I've got a matrix and the this is just a name and the name is going to take on all the values in this array and then I can use from the expression syntax I can use matrix dot name to get access to the value. So here I've got a build job 
and it's going to expand out into multiple build jobs using a matrix strategy. And then instead of saying run one, instead of having one job explicitly spelled out that say run this one on Ubuntu latest, and then another one saying run on Windows latest, I can just use the value of this OS name from the matrix and say run on matrix.os. So when this gets expanded, this will be Ubuntu latest for one, and it'll be Windows latest for the other. And here I can differentiate between those two by giving them different display names. So this name field for a job is just what's displayed in the GUI, in the web GUI when we look at it in GitHub. And these environment variables are all the same, whether I'm running on Windows or on Linux, doesn't matter. Uh, the checkout is the same. This download Bison, I only need to do that if my OS is Windows latest. And uh, the if value on a step evaluates its, or sorry, the if key on, the st on a step object it evaluates the value as a, 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 a GitHub action expression. So I didn't need to put the, you know, the dollar brace brace around this little expression. I could, but it's not strictly required. So it's just a little bit, reads a little bit cleaner just to get rid of that syntactical noise. So this step here will only run if the value of matrix.os is equal to windows-latest, because we don't need to do any of this. First of all, we don't have PowerShell on Ubuntu, so it's just going to fail anyway. But we don't need to do any of that. It's, it's windows only. So we've got that called out as a specific windows only step. And then we've got our standard steps here. Do the, you know, just put out the version of CMake we're using. And the reason that I find this to be useful is because we are not controlling what version of CMake we're using in our build we're at the mercy of whatever is cooked into the runners that are provided by GitHub. So it's always good to know what version of CMake you're using because maybe you do something uh, on your development machine where you update to a newer version of CMake than what's in the runner and then you use a feature that's only available in the newer version of CMake on your local machine. You don't realize that the runner doesn't support that functionality and you know, it, CMake, you know, maybe you're trying to use a variable, and then the value of the variable is just empty on the runner, and you're trying to understand why does it not work on the runner, but it works on my machine. So I just find it useful when you depend on stuff from the environment of the runner to to know what you're getting. Uh, so we do our configure step, and we've switched everything to use these uh, ex GitHub expressions, so that we're not relying on the operating specific syntax for accessing, accessing an environment variable. And the only part that's duplicated down here is when we run ctest because we want to exclude those tests that are failing on, on Ubuntu. And when we fix those tests so that they run cleanly on both platforms, we'll just get rid of one of these and we'll get rid of the condition on the other one. So I've got these two conditions set to be mutually exclusive. So this will run on a run when it is Ubuntu. This will run when it's not Ubuntu. I find that to be a better way to express mutually exclusive conditions rather than to say uh, matrix OS equals Windows latest. Because what if I add up here, what if I add the uh, Mac OS? You know, let's just say I add the Mac OS to the my OS matrix and it happens to be that the Mac OS OS one behaves like the Windows one, you know, it's more likely that the Mac OS one is going to behave like Ubuntu. And so I would switch the value here that I'm comparing against. I'd compare against Windows latest instead of Ubuntu latest. But I, I find it useful when trying to express mutually exclusive conditions on steps that we write them in such a way that it's obvious from looking at it that they represent the opposite condition. Uh, another way you, you can get even more explicit, uh, you could write it like this. Um, I think that's valid. I don't know what is. I'm getting a squiggle in Visual Studio is saying it doesn't like it. Doesn't like it. I think you can write that though. There, it supports parentheses. Um, at any rate. 
just an aside there, always when you want to write conditions that are mutually exclusive on the steps within a job, write them in such a way that it's obvious that they're mutually exclusive. Um, and I think, oh, I got some more tags. Okay, so let's look at uh, V13. What was different? V12 to V13. Oh, okay. Now, I mentioned that there is a template out there. So let's go look at that template. So, um, again, this is one that I found because it had a high number of stars, no, high number of forks. A lot, lots of people are using it. So this is a project template. It, so it's not just a template for workflows. It's a template for everything. And if we look inside here, it's using CMake presets. It's got a CMake build. It's uh, got VC package consumed as a Git module. And then it's got uh, workflows for running a build and test cycle. And it's got some dependencies specified via a, a, a VC package a manifest file. Now, all I want to do is just grab the workflows, but the workflows are coupled to the presets through the commands that they're going to invoke. And we haven't done an explicit presentation on CMake presets, but you can just think of it as a, a JSON file that gives you named um, bags of um, name value pairs that you can use to specify commonly used settings for CMake variables and other uh, command line arguments to CMake like which generator you're going to use, which build configuration you're going to use, which build type, and so on. You can just think of it like that. And if we if we just take a quick look at their CMake presets, uh, these presets can stack on top of each other. So here's a configure presets, here's the name of the preset, Ninja multi VC package. Um, so there, uh, if you if you're not familiar with Ninja, it's it's kind of like Make, but whereas Make uses um, a single configuration, so when you use the Make file generator in in CMake, if you want to have both a, a debug build and a release build at the same time, you have to configure CMake twice in different directories: once for the release build and once for the debug build. That's different from the way Visual Studio solutions work where it's a so-called multi-config generator and in Visual Studio it, you generate it once and then you just specify which configuration to build at the time that you build or the time that you run. Ninja is also got a multi-config generator so that you in a single directory on Linux you can have both debug builds and release builds built out of the same directory. So that's why he's preferring Ninja instead of the make file generator and you can see down in here that he's specifying the toolchain file as the the file that comes out of VC package and he's specifying the the CMake generator he's specifying the the binary directory unfortunately he puts the binary directory inside the source dir which I don't happen to like but that's the way he's done it I, I've asked him why he decided to do it that way I prefer out of tree builds uh, so that's a configure preset. He's got build presets that specify the configuration, either debug or release, and so on. And then there's these test presets um, that specify the different C test configurations. So in his workflow, we'll just take a look at it. He's got two workflows here. Um, this is the one we're going to look at. And you can see it doesn't, it's got a lot of comments there's not actually a lot in here in terms of meat. He's he's got support for Ubuntu, Mac OS, Windows, and uh, ARM. So x64 and ARM, uh, x64 ARM, and x64 x86. Uh, so he's got an Ubuntu ARM build working in here as well with his uh, basic starting template. Uh, he's using the checkout action with submodules true, just like we were doing. Then he's using this get CMake action. And you notice here, 
instead of it coming from actions, it's coming from the user Luca, assuming that's how you say it, and Luca is the same person that's created this template. So he's got his own GitHub action that he's implemented in a separate repository called get CMake, and that gets the head CMake version, right? So the currently the, the highest version of CMake that's currently available. And he's using the latest uh, tag on his get CMake repo to specify the version of this action. So you're using in the latest version of the action that gets the latest version of CMake. Whereas we were depending on CMake coming from the runner environment. So that's one, one difference so far. And then his next thing is he's got a run VC package action, again, one that he's written, and he's specifying the manifest file with this VSON, sorry, VC package JSON glob input parameter to the action. And we're using version, he's using version 11 of his action. And then he's got a step down here that's run CMake plus VC package plus Ninja plus C test to build packages and generate build and generate slash build slash test the code. So he's got one pre-built step that does the combination of the configure, the build, and the C test. And he wires up the settings for that by specifying a configure preset, a build preset, and a test preset. And that's why to use this workflow, we need to have a CMake presets.json. So, going back over here, uh, I've updated my repository and uh, I've got this CMake presets.json that I just copied from his um, template. And the only thing that's different. Well, I haven't made the differences yet. So this is initially, I've just copied his CMake presets over to my repo. And then I've got a copy of his workflow copied into my repo. So now let's go look at what that looks like over in. So you might have noticed over here, this is all workflows. We were looking at the build workflow that I created by hand. And here's his workflow. I've temporarily disabled it so that I could, you know, I, I only have one of the, I only need one of these at a time. I just had his disabled for a moment. So when I initially added his, if we look at the jobs that ran, so it did this get CMake where it went and got the latest version of CMake instead of relying on the one from the runner. And it attempted to restore from cache, but there wasn't anything in the cache yet. And then it, when it ran that combination of CMake configure with VC package as a tool chain, and then use Ninja to do the build, and then use C test to do the test, we got the error at um, those same failing tests that we had before, right? So we, these four tests are still failing on Linux. So what I needed to do was update the presets to include, if you look at the preset file, for the test preset, I needed to add, it a, fil add a filter to exclude the tests that are failing. And if I then run the workflow again, I guess there's, let's go back one more. So here's the second run of the workflow, and now everything's green. I, I commented out, and the only change I made to the workflow was to just narrow the OS matrix to just Ubuntu, uh, because I just wanted to show you the effect of caching. Uh, so everything was green now, but if we go back and look at the log of how long it took. So that first job 
took four minutes and 17 seconds to run. Now it failed in the test phase. So the build phase where it generated the build artifacts for the dependencies, that phase succeeded. So the build artifacts for the dependencies were present and they could be cached. And that's why the second run took only 1 minute 42 seconds compared to 4 minutes 17 seconds for the first run. Because on this second run, if we look in the job, there's restore from cache and I'm not sure which step it is in here. It's probably, well, build VC package executable, one of these did the uh, restored the local restored to the local runner environment the cached build products from the previous build and you might say okay uh, where are those cache products and if we go to the summary for the build and then back to the build for, or back to the workflow over here in this caches area here's all the cached products and you can see that I have 61 things there and that's one-to-one -one with all my dependencies that I'm pulling in via VC package now unfortunately however this is implemented and I don't know if this is the fault of VC package or if it's the fault of his custom action but they're all just called VC package so I don't know which one of these little cached artifacts is corresponds to what library right there's there's no way for me to inspect it um, this link just takes me to the develop branch of my repository so that's not going to tell me and then over here the only thing I can do with it is delete it so for if for whatever reason I needed to manually delete one of these cached dependencies I wouldn't know which one to delete there isn't any way for me to to really tell as I've opened an issue on his template project uh, to see if he if that's a choice he made or if it's a choice that VC package made but you can see that caching is definitely worthwhile we shaved off um, if you go back here we shaved off you know like uh, two and a half minutes maybe that's what it looks like to me this is almost two minutes and this is just over four minutes so we shaved off like a two and a half minutes from the build now the Windows build definitely takes longer and if I had implemented the uh, OS matrix for Windows if we look at these from when I manually did it you know the Windows build is taking seven minutes and the Ubuntu build is taking three minutes 40 now um, you know this three minutes or this three minutes 50 is comparable to what we saw for that first run with the other workflow that did caching uh, the reason that the Windows one tends to take longer is um, A, it's just the nature of the beast. MSVC is not the fastest uh, thing to build code with. And uh, Windows also, I've been told, like the file system, depending on which version of NTFS you're on, it, it's not particularly happy with lots of small files, which is what builds tend to produce. Um, and we're using the multi-config generator on ninja but if you're using a make file generator when vc package builds the dependencies it only builds one i think it only builds one in other words it doesn't build release and debug it just builds the one you've selected i could be wrong about that at any rate you can see that caching would be a, a win for windows as well probably push it down to about two minutes like the other one probably a little bit just a little bit longer maybe two minutes 30 two minutes 45 instead of two minutes 15 so there you go um, that's the basics of github workflows and github actions and as I mentioned there's a lot more to it that you can do every any interaction with the repository can be modeled with an automated process uh, for build and test um, this is much I've used Travis CI before which was the previous thing that people were primarily using for their open source projects this is much nicer a uh, lot more um, the, the documentation is better not that the Travis documentation was awful but just the github documentation is very good and the fact that I have access to Mac 
runners is very nice. I never had access to that before. And the usage uh, limits are high enough that for my open source project, I'm unlikely to run into them. I don't know if you noticed, but there was no limit on you know, number of minutes of execution per month or anything like that. The limits were all amount of uh, uh, surrounding uh, how many things can you do at once as opposed to how many things you can do per unit of time. Uh, other than like the timeouts, right? You know, six hours to time out a step and 36 hours or whatever it was to time out a workflow. So um, it's nice and you, you can access everything through the web UI if you don't already have actions associated with your repository when you click on this action button it will kinda of look at your code and identify what languages you're using and it'll have some um, starter workflows that it'll recommend it's got a starter workflow for CMake and so on um, so it's they they made it even though it's a very configurable and you know, it can be an elaborate mechanism to get started. It's not particularly difficult, and they've they provided good shortcuts for getting started on a fresh repository. Uh, I wanted to learn how to do it from scratch, so I didn't use their boilerplate starting point templates. I wanted to understand the steps from the bottom up, and that's why I just started with a a simple YAML file that I built up the my configure, build, and test steps separately, and then I could understand better how to compare it to these templates that are being offered. So that's GitHub Actions. Do we have any uh, questions before we wrap up? Okay, well then, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next month.